Hello everyone, welcome back. In this video, I wanna talk a bit more about the DOT product and the two versions of the DOT product that we have seen. So the two versions of the DOT product that I'm referring to are the component version and the trigonometric version of the DOT product. In the trigonometric version, we say that uh, V dotted with W is equal to the magnitude of V multiplied by the magnitude of W, which is also multiplied by cosine of theta, where theta is the angle between our two vectors. Well, if we know the uh, components of our vectors V and W, suppose those components are A1 and B1 for our vector V, and our vector W has components of A2 and B2 for I and J respectively, then we can also compute our dot product algebraically just using uh, A1 times A2 plus B1 times B2, or in other words, taking the sum of the products of the respective components between our two vectors. So what I wanna spend the next few minutes doing is showing that these two formulas actually are equal to each other and it doesn't matter which one we use when evaluating the dot product, it just depends on which set of information we have at our disposal. All right, so in order to prove that the magnitude of V times the magnitude of W times cosine of theta is equal to A1A2 plus B1B2, we're gonna start by drawing a picture. So we're assuming that our vector of V has components of A1I and B1J, and W has components of A2I and B2J. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna put the, uh, the tails of each of these vectors together at the origin or the point zero, zero. All right, so now we're just gonna draw a picture of what two random vectors might look like. So maybe our vector V with components of A1, B1 looks something like this, and our vector W with components of A2, B2 looks something like this. It doesn't actually matter which quadrant we place these vectors in as long as they appear different. This argument that we're gonna come up with is gonna work no matter what kind of picture we draw or how we place these vectors. And so, well, because we place the tails of these vectors at the origin zero, zero, we kind of know where the, uh, the tips or the endpoints of these vectors would lie at. So this point up here, at the tip of our vector V would have X and Y coordinates of A1 and B1. Similarly, our point at the end of our vector W would have X and Y coordinates of A2 and B2. And so don't forget, we also eventually at some point in our dot product, we're gonna need this angle theta, which is the angle between our two vectors of interest W and V. And to finish setting up our picture, we're gonna add in one more vector that goes from the end of W to the end of V. This is just really gonna be a placeholder vector for us, and at least for now, we're gonna call this vector U. All right, so by drawing this picture with our two vectors and this intermediate vector U, we now are looking at an oblique or non-right triangle. And if we think about this trigonometric version of our dot product that involves the magnitude of our vectors and cosine of the angle theta, that suggests that we might use our triangle to try to relate these side lengths and this angle together. And one of our formulas we learned about recently that can help us do this is gonna be our law of cosines formula. So one thing we need to kind of set up before we start applying our law of cosines formula to our picture is, well, these vectors, V, U, and W are vectors. Uh, they're telling us how to get to these points in space, but they're not actually side lengths of our triangles. So the vectors themselves do not give the side lengths of the triangle we are gonna analyze here, but the magnitudes of the vectors do. So now when we set up the law of cosines using the side lengths of our oblique triangle here, we're gonna be using the magnitude of our vectors in place of like A, B, and C. All right, so we're gonna use the law of cosines now to set up a relationship between our side lengths and our angle here. And so the law of cosines, or one way to state it, says A squared is equal to B squared plus C squared minus two times B times C times cosine of our angle A. Well, our triangle isn't set up with A, B, and C in our angle A, so we have to make the uh, correct substitutions here. Our angle of interest is theta, so that's gonna be playing the role of our angle A here, and that means our uh, side length of little a is gonna have to be played by the role of the magnitude of our vector U. So writing our law of cosines in terms of how we labeled our uh, oblique triangle is gonna look like this. We're gonna have the magnitude of u squared is equal to, and now it doesn't really matter which of our other two side lengths or vectors we use for b and c. Let's just go ahead and say the magnitude of u squared is equal to the magnitude of v squared plus the magnitude of w squared minus 
two times the magnitude of V times the magnitude of W times cosine of the angle between V and W, which is our angle theta. And so now we have rewritten our law of cosines using our triangle to describe these relationships between our side lengths and angles. And we can see that last piece of our law of cosines involves the magnitude of V times the magnitude of W times cosine of theta. But that is our dot product in a trigonometric form. So we're gonna leave that piece alone and now try to write the remaining pieces of our law of cosines formula in terms of these components, A1, A2, B1, and B2. All right, so our next step is to express the magnitude squareds of these side lengths in terms of the components of our vectors for V and W. And so remember, V was our vector with the components of A1 and B1. And if we want to find the magnitude of a vector, we just have to remember we can use that Pythagorean theorem or distance formula to help us do that. We're just going to take the, uh, the sums of the squares of the components. So the actual magnitude of V is the square root of A1 squared plus B1 squared. But in our law of cosines formula up here, we're working with the magnitude squared for these pieces we want to substitute. So we're just going to leave and work with that squared version instead. So similarly, our vector w had components of a2 and b2, so its magnitude squared is just going to be the sum of a2 squared with b2 squared. And so we have this third, I refer to it as a placeholder vector u. We don't want to describe its components as like a3, b3. Instead, we want to describe the components of u using the components of v and w. Our vector u is just the vector that's starting at our point a2, b2 and ending at our point a1, b1. And so we can find the components of our vector u just by taking the difference between the x-coordinates and y-coordinates respectively. So our first component or our i component for our vector u would look like a1 minus a2. And our second component for our vector u would look similar. It'd be b1 minus b2. So it doesn't necessarily help us with our little calculation or computation here, but we can also recognize that our vector u really is just the difference between our vectors v and w. Doing some little uh, vector addition and subtraction should help us realize this. All right, so now we know how to express the components of our vector u in terms of the other components we know, a1, b1, a2, and b2. So the magnitude of u squared is gonna look like the quantity a1 minus a2 squared, and we add to that the square of the second component, which is the difference between B1 and B2. All right, now that we know how to express the, uh, the magnitudes of these three vectors in our law of cosines in terms of the components of our two vectors, U and V, we're ready to substitute these expressions into our law of cosines formula and finish establishing the connection between our trigonometric and algebraic or component version of our dot product. So let's see, the magnitude of u squared is going to be a1 minus a2 squared plus b1 minus b2 squared. We'll have to expand that in our next step, but for now we're just making our initial substitution. So this is like the left-hand side of our law of cosines formula. That's going to be equal to the right-hand side. We're only going to substitute the magnitude squares because that last term contained the factor of the magnitude of v, the magnitude of w, and cosine of theta is our other version of our dot product. So the magnitude of v squared is right here, and that's looking like a1 squared plus b1 squared. We have to add to that the magnitude of w squared, which will also give us an a2 squared as well as a b2 squared. And then we're subtracting away from that this last piece that we're not really messing with, at least for now. So that's still gonna be minus two times the magnitude of v times the magnitude of w times cosine of theta. So our next step is basically going to be to expand and combine like terms and eventually isolate or solve for the magnitude of V times the magnitude of W times cosine of theta or our dot product for V and W. So in order to expand the left-hand side of our equation, we're gonna have to use the distributive property or FOIL these expressions out. So if we look at A1 minus A2 squared or A1 minus A2 times another factor of A1 minus A2, we're gonna get a1 squared minus two copies of A1 and A2 multiplied together. You have to add on top of that an A2 squared quantity. We're gonna get a very similar looking expression when we expand the difference between B1 and B2. 
that'll end up looking like b1 squared minus two times b1 times b2 plus b2 squared. So we've expanded the left-hand side, and now we're just gonna copy down our right-hand side. Nothing to expand or combine there at the moment. The right-hand side is still a1 squared plus b1 squared plus a2 squared plus b2 squared minus two times the magnitude of v times the magnitude of w times cosine of theta. All right, and so now we can start moving things around and actually notice first off that we have lots of like or common terms on each side of our equation that we can subtract away or cancel out. So we have an a1 squared on both sides that we can subtract away and cancel out. We also have an a2 squared on each side, a b1 squared, and a b2 squared to cancel out as well. Well, what is left over after these initial cancellations? On the left-hand side, we have negative two times a1 times a2. We also have a negative two times b1 times b2, and that's equal to our right-hand side where everything canceled out except negative two times the magnitude of v multiplied by the magnitude of w multiplied by cosine of theta. Well, our next step is to recognize, well, every term on both sides of our equation has a common factor of negative two. So our last step is to divide away this common factor of negative two. If we remove the factor of negative two from every term inside of our equation, what we end up with on the left-hand side is positive a1 times a2 plus b1 times b2 and that's equal to our right-hand side with that negative two factor removed. That's the magnitude of V times the magnitude of W times cosine of theta. But what is the left-hand side of our equation? Well, that's our dot product in its component form. What's the right-hand side of our equation? Well, that's the dot product in its trigonometric form. So that's our little proof showing that these two versions of our dot product truly are equal or equivalent to each other. In this example, we are asked to find the angle between the two vectors u and v, where our vector u is defined as 3i minus 4j, and our vector v is negative 5i plus 6j. So remember the dot product says that the dot product between our two vectors u and v is equivalent to the magnitude of our vector u multiplied by the magnitude of our vector v, also multiplied by cosine of theta, where theta is that angle we are looking for, that angle between our two vectors. All right, so now with the information we have been provided, we should be able to compute most of the pieces of this equation. The only unknown piece that we'll be able to solve for is cosine of our angle theta. So to get started with, let's compute the dot product between our two vectors, u and v. And we can compute this dot product because we are given and know the components of our two vectors, u and v. So remember to take the dot product component wise, we multiply the respective i and j components together and then take the sum of those products. So for u dotted with v, we're gonna have to multiply three and negative five together. That's the product of the first or i components. And then we add to that the product of our second or our j components, and that'll be negative four multiplied by six. So now if we compute that, we get negative 15 minus 24, or negative 39. And so now we know u dotted with v is gonna be equal to negative 39. The next two pieces of information we need to find are the magnitude of u and the magnitude of v. So remember, we can always find the magnitude of a vector by taking the square root of the sum of the squares of its components that comes from the Pythagorean theorem or distance formula. So if we're looking at that for our first vector u here, we have to take the square root of the sum of the squares of these components. So our first component is three. We have to square that and add to that the square of our second component. That's the square of negative four. And then we can't forget for the magnitude, we have to take the square root of this uh, sum. So three squared is nine, negative four squared is positive 16. Add those together and you get 25. So the magnitude of u is equal to the square root of 25, which simplifies to just five. 
So next up, we need to find the magnitude of E, which is found through the same process, just by taking the square root of the sums of the square of the components of V. We're gonna take that first component, negative five, and square that. Add to that our second component of six squared, take the square root of that sum, and that'll give us the magnitude of our second vector V. So negative five squared is 25, six squared is 36. And if you add that together, you're gonna get 61. And so the magnitude of V is equal to the square root of 61, and that's not a square root we could simplify, so we'll just leave it as the square root of 61. All right, so now we really have those three pieces of information we needed to use our dot product formula to help us solve for cosine of theta and then theta itself. So let's go ahead and plug in all the information we know. So what we found was that u dotted with v was equal to negative 39. So the left-hand side of our dot product equation can be switched out with negative 39. On the right-hand side, we can make some substitutions as well. We found the magnitude of u to be equal to five. We have to multiply that by the magnitude of v, which was the square root of 61. And that'll get multiplied with cosine of our unknown angle theta. But now we can solve for cosine of theta and take cosine inverse of that equation to find that angle of theta, the angle between our two vectors. So we just divide both sides by five times the square root of 61 to solve for cosine of theta. Cosine of theta will be equal to negative 39 over five times the square root of 61. We could rationalize that denominator and simplify it, but I don't think that's worth doing because we're just gonna take cosine inverse of that expression anyways. So theta is equal to exactly cosine inverse of negative 39 over five times the square root of 61. And so that's what we'd enter into our calculator and uh, maybe round it to a decimal place or two. And if we take the time to do that here, we should find that theta is equal to approximately 177.1 degrees.